Today we're talking about quantum machine learning, of course, and specifically a, a reoccurring theme, shall we say, of uh, some of my more recent discussions of it. What is the potential applications and where does the value come in of quantum machine learning? I think a lot of it um, comes back to a previous video I made called What is Quantum Machine Learning Good For? I'll, I'll link that in the uh, dis in the description of this video but basically in that video i was asking like what i guess simply what what is quantum machine learning good for what applications or problems or areas can we actually apply quantum machine learning for because a lot of what i was seeing at the time and this uh keep in mind was two years ago so this is not you know more than two years ago i guess um so this is not you know including the latest and greatest technology but I think all of that um, has been growing now in in the community. I think it's sort of been a shift uh, as perhaps the, the failures of NISC technology play out, then we see, you know, people shifting towards a more, more skeptical perspective on a lot of these matters. And that was sort of, I mean, I haven't done a lot of work in QML in, in a while, and in large part because of that uh, skepticism of, you know, QML being realistic, QML being applicable. And so what we're going to talk about today is, is a couple papers that came out somewhat recently within the last, I don't know, eight months at least, um, and see sort of what, maybe what, what is QML good for part two? And Specifically, we'll be looking at sort of practical considerations of QML literature and theoretical considerations of, of QML. And, and by this, I mean, we're not going to be so abstract, perhaps, as the last video, but more focused on what are, you know, what, what do what does the literature actually say, right? Like, I, I was super vague in my last video about actually talking about any specific papers, but here, right, we're, we're looking at papers, and we're looking at specifically, these are sort of review-ish papers. And so with that, we can see, like, what what is the literature claiming in quantum machine learning, and is it or isn't it true? So first up, we have this paper here, Better Than Classical, The Subtle Art of Benchmarking Quantum Machine Learning Models. Um, and I actually don't think it's uh that subtle to be honest uh when when we get to the paper you'll see what i'm talking about but basically um yeah the I, the subtle art of benchmarking is just like normal benchmarking ideas they're just not done in quantum machine learning papers in fact I, i've finished reviewing now i think for nerves was the last conference um I keep getting these QML papers I have to review. Uh, and for these conferences, usually I like to do more ML papers now, but all of them, this, like, I just read these papers and none of them benchmark anything. That is like, it is not a subtle art that is missing from the QML community. It is the whole art, the entire painting is gone. It is not there. Um, and so that's, that's to me, there, there's not a lot of subtlety. It's just like, Oh, we introduce a new algorithm. Here's how it performs on a random benchmark we made up. And also we don't compare it to any other quantum machine learning model or even really a classical model. And it's just like, okay, well, I, I guess that's a, all right, great. I guess that's a paper right there, you know? Um, and so, right, right. Like this is not 2018. We can't, people can't keep getting away with that, you know? Um, and so, uh, what we have in this paper um, right here from a uh, team at Xanadu is basically taking a bunch of papers, popular quantum machine learning models, and just looking at them and actually benchmarking them. And so um, the first part, of course, doesn't really matter. Introduction never matters. Uh, we obviously, the need for scientific rigor, basically here we're saying, they're saying like, okay, you just need to actually do benchmarking. Um, of course, there's a lot of complexities that even happen in ML benchmarking, like oh, train testing, benchmarks, free lunches, you know, there's there's a whole thing in, in ML that, that people need to take more seriously, but that's not even, we're, we're not at that point yet. We're not at like, oh, we have a leaderboard and we need to like think about the leaderboard breakdown. How does it change with different parameters? Like that's, if we even had a leaderboard, that would be nice. Like imagine um, there's, 
uh, the website that maintains um, the like leaderboards for a lot of these um, um, like classical machine learning problems, papers with code, I believe it's called. And so it has like, you know, ImageNet. What are like, if I just go right now and bring it up, like this is what I mean, right? It's just like papers with code. This is just a bunch of papers, how they perform top one accuracy. You want number of, pro okay, that was a mistake. Uh, top one accuracy, you can just look, right? You can say, you know, these are the papers. This is this is what we're talking about. And then there's nuance here. This would be a subtle art, I think, of like evaluating this properly. But you cannot do this for quantum because no one uses even the same benchmark. Um, so that's that's the first thing. The second thing is, should we be using MNIST for quantum machine learning? I mean, no, right? Like, I feel like the answer is no. Uh, in this, in this, they say that. MNIST, right? Like no one actually does MNIST. We just PCA it down to a smaller dimensional space, which is like, what does that even mean um, in terms of the complexity of that task then? And so, so, you know, th there's a lot that people do with MNIST just because it feels like the default. But in, in general, already, it's like you're doing classical data with quantum machine learning. It's kind of like, kind of skeptical already, to be honest. I think I probably expressed that in my last video as well. But even like PC, PCAing it down to from 784 to eight dimensions, it's like, you, you know, MNIST can already be solved by looking at one pixel basically. So just MNISTing it down and getting 70% accuracy on it, like, and not even comparing to other papers, like practically that's kind of not super meaningful. Um, so now they, they select a number of papers, they implement them, they go through all the details, it doesn't really matter, and then they say, let's actually look at how things perform on just a collection of data sets, right? Like these are trivial benchmarks, uh, and let's see how things perform on them. From the literature, actually comparing them on the same benchmarks, doing looking at the hyperparameters, stuff like that. And so what we see, uh, perhaps, unsurprisingly, I should say not perhaps almost entirely unsurprisingly, is that, um, right, we have just, just throw a random MLP at it, and it's just going to be quantum. You can see the blue here is the number of, uh, is like how it ranked, and blue is like top ranking. Uh, and so you can see, right, like you, you just throw it at some tasks, like, yeah, MLPs are just going to win. Like you don't even, there's, there's no point. Um, to doing these other ones uh, when you benchmark it against MLPs. And that's maybe surprising, maybe not. I don't, um, I don't have an intuition on what other people would think of it. That's not particularly surprising to me. But the point here is not that MLPs are so great, which, you know, they're pretty great, but that when we're doing this benchmarking, it's like that we can do a quantum computer on... Um, you know, this uh, uh, problem is not the goal. I don't think, I think fundamentally aiming for better performance on classical machine learning tasks is kind of, I don't know, a dead end maybe of QML and maybe, maybe not. Uh, but like, what, what's the reason we do quantum computing in the first place? Because we can, we think we can do certain things faster that's the, the whole motivation originally, right? Is because everything we can do on a quantum computer, we can do on a classical computer. It just takes more time. And so the idea is like, okay, well, we can do a certain set of problems faster. And potentially, although this is a new discussion, right, with how much energy all, all of like modern ML methods take, maybe you can do it more energy efficiently. I don't, I don't know about that as much, but that's certainly a claim someone can make. But, and so you would at least want it to match the performance, but that's the thing that's not really discussed in these papers is the actual speed of the physical machine, right? Like we want to do an apples to apples comparison. We, we, how, how long does this take? And, and spoiler alert, it's going to take a lot of time depending on your implementation, depending on if you're running this on a superconducting qubit system or if you're running this on a trapped ion system, like those are orders and or many orders of magnitude difference in speed. 
And so you may not even be able to go that fast, right? If you need thousands of samples from some trapped ion and it's like, what, we're talking like milliseconds, right? You're probably on the order of seconds at that point. And so like that's, that's the uh, sort of the main point of quantum computing originally. And it's interesting to see everything in quantum machine learning diverge from that. There's no like claims of literal algorithmic speed up. Sometimes there's claims of trainability speed ups, which is interesting um, and maybe possible, but that's a, just something to consider when you see these results is like, is this even about, is this even an interesting like accuracy? Is that even an interesting number to go after? But the other interesting effects of this paper is, or the results of this paper is that one, uh, it's not super relevant, is that do a lot, you see this all the time. People do a, a classical machine learning network. And, and I want to be clear, I'm not, you know, younger, younger versions of me were guilty of this too. I'm not trying to, uh, to act all high and mighty. Um, so I'm just, I think my mind has changed as I progressed in, in scientific research. And so I'm not, right, I'm not calling, calling specific papers out or anything like that. I'm just saying in general, I think we as a field, we, we learned, right, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of questions early on in this, and we've learned a lot of things. And so let's take what we've learned and, and, and advance as a field and stop doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and that one of those things you see, or you used to see, I don't know actually how common it is anymore, is just sticking, slapping a quantum thing somewhere in the network, right at the beginning, right at the end, just slap the quantum circuit at the end. Does that even help? Um, and so what they look at here is uh, in figure 14, that's not what I wanted to see, is you can see basically um, what is the neural network actually doing? There's a better figure somewhere. Um, but basically uh, what they say is that do these quantum components help? Not really. Uh, there's, it's like, it's unclear if it's, it's useful at all since it just basically doesn't have a lot of effective transformations that it's learning. And so that was always a question that came up, right? Was like, if you have a big, especially for papers that had bigger neural networks, right? If you have like 10,000 parameters or more in your neural network, and then you slap 15 parameter QML model at the end, you could probably just take the QML model off and it would probably work. And so that's, uh, that's another point that they bring up here. The other point that's interesting, there's some remarks on data reuploading and kernels that, that are interesting, but we won't cover here. Uh, and the last point that uh, I want to remark on for this paper is that if you take yeah, somewhere, where was it? If you take, uh, yeah, well, I already said this, but out of the box classical models just default beat any optimized QML models. That's That was sort of the first figure I showed. But the other point, this was the one I wanted to make was that quantum circuits without entanglement do pretty well. Yeah, there's an RL paper actually, um, it's like, I'm blanking on the name right now, but it's basically like non-entangled quantum policy. Uh, and so uh, if you looked that up, I'm sure you could find it. It's also, if you go to the, uh, go to the um, list of quantum machine learning papers I maintain and look in the RL section, you'll also find it there. But basically, they're like, yeah, you don't need, you don't need R, you don't need entanglement. In fact, you can do better without entanglement. Um, and so you see this here too in figure, um, figure eleven, figure twelve is what we want to see. Or sorry, yeah, figure uh, sorry thirteen here. It's so separable. Basically, means no entanglement. And what we can see is that um, you don't really have much of a cost associated with it, sometimes not a cost at all uh, associated with removing the entanglement, right? Like if you remove the entanglement from a normal quantum machine learning or a quantum algorithm, right? Like, okay, I'm going to do this, uh, I'm going to do the Shores algorithm without any entanglement. Um, or uh, I want to do this fast Fourier transform without 
any entanglement, even even doing like basic, like, oh yeah, I want to do the quantum teleportation algorithm, like the most, one of the simple two qubit algorithms, right? And you take out the entanglement, like it that doesn't work because it's the whole point of doing quantum computing is entanglement. If you just have superpositions that you have to operate on basically, and there's no entanglement associated with it, then you're basically just sort of doing parallelism, I guess, at that point. Um, I know people get mad when you say, oh, super, super positions are just things in parallel. But if you have no entanglement, then, okay, it's not really in parallel because you don't actually have, you can't measure both states. So it's just like a worse version of parallel, I guess, without entanglement. But there's not a lot of reason to do quantum computing if you don't have entanglement. That's, that's like the core. If there's one thing that matters in quantum computing, it's probably entanglement and superposition. And superposition matters because of entanglement. Um, and so all of this is to say, right, like if you can just take the quantum um, entanglement out of your QML model, you don't need to be doing a QML model. So like every paper should have a benchmark. Every, like go through, I, I would be genuinely curious to go through every single right of these like thousands of papers that they, they brought up at the beginning and say, take everyone, take out the entanglement and run it again. If it performs close to as well, like you're just doing a bad, like your, your QML model is just a bad neural network. And the only argument you could have for your bad neural network is that it's faster or more energy efficient or something on actual hardware, but that never comes up. And so that is absolutely one of the most important things I think to take away from this, uh, especially if you're doing research is like, you know, not all papers that just do a quantum circuit are necessarily not good, but it's like, if you're going to just do quantum circuit, run it, see, see how it looks without entanglement. And if it does well without entanglement, just consider that you might not actually need to do a quantum circuit at all. Uh, so that's, that's basically the first paper. And so moving on to the second paper is a, uh, is a more theoretical one. And we're, we're going to go through this last two pretty quickly, but I'll just summarize the idea is basically, how do I make that go away? Um, is to say, uh, what can we do with quantum machine learning models that we can actually train? Um, of course, I think it's, uh, I think it's funny that <laughs> there's a this whole there's a whole line of Baron Plateau research that, that came out of um, that came out of certain works done at Los Alamos and, and uh, I mean there's a certain irony in just all of these papers being published and then also Los Alamos publishing a paper that says actually this is this is not the way to go um, it's like they made it up and then they decided, no, this is, this is not it. Um, I don't know. It's just kind of, it's a bit funny. Uh, but looking at this paper, basically the idea that they don't explicitly prove, but, uh, attempt to give a lot of examples of is that if you have a model that you can train without barren plateaus, does that mean you can efficiently simulate that model? Because if we can't, if we have barren plateaus, then it's kind of like, the QML model is just hard to scale, right? It's kind of in GMI from a scaling perspective. But if we don't have barren plateaus, then we can scale it. But does that mean we can classically simulate it? In which case, there's no point in doing the quantum machine learning model. Uh, and so what they look at here is they actually, lots of theory, right? In theory doesn't matter. Um, so what we're getting to here is basically for a set, you know, theory, 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 for all of these specific um, like approaches that are used to sort of avoid um, the barren plateau problem or other trainability problems. Uh, what they look at is they say, basically all of these, um, all of these papers um, can actually be uh, like, there's a sort of way to make them efficiently simulatable. And so, uh, well, really what they do is they show like uh, this class of problems is efficiently simulatable and you can sort of map all of them to this class is the idea. But 
what does this mean? I, of course, we're not going to go through all of this. Uh, um, right, this is this is uh, how you would do it, right? You could say, how do I simulate it? When is it simulable? And so there's all of this stuff. Um, but and so the question is basically from this paper that we're not going to go through in any more detail is basically when are QML models trainable and also not classically simulatable. And so that's something that, you know, maybe, maybe not is, is uh, theoretically derivable, but at the very least is a practical relevance, right? Like, can we simulate these models efficiently? And so that's another practical consideration when it comes to scaling, right? It's like a lot of people do just like small models. And then maybe you don't have barren plateaus because you're just dealing with a small enough uh, situation that you don't have to deal with them. But as things scale and you have to deal with barren plateaus or similar trainability issues, it's worth considering if I can avoid them, can I just efficiently simulate it? Because that's maybe true, maybe not true. Uh, but a follow-up to this work is actually right here um, that I just saw recently. So I, I haven't fully read it, but um, it, there, this is sort of, a, you consider this sort of a follow-up paper to it um, in the sense that here we're talking about trainability and dequantization, right? Dequantization is depending on what you mean by it and, and they have some different definitions in here, right? Some, some people would take dequantization to mean like a, um, taking the quantum, right? What does it mean? Like D to unquantize something, to remove the quantum aspect of it. So uh, a lot of times it doesn't necessarily mean classically simulating a quantum like tensor network circuit, but it might mean like um, a quantum inspired classical algorithm that performs as well as it does. Uh, th there's not like, at least in, in when people say dequantization, it doesn't necessarily mean like a very specific thing. Uh, depending on how people talk about it. Um, and so this is sort of related though, right? We have this figure where, right, we need trainable things that are practically relevant that aren't dequantizable. Um, and, and so this is what we're sort of aiming at. Uh, and so the question of the last work is basically, does, uh, so this overlap, right, of trainable and non-dequantizable uh, does this overlap that's shown right here, I don't know if my mouse can be seen, it exist. Um, and so there's, or, or does it exist overlapping with the practically relevant? I'm, I'm sure in the last one, you could certainly construct a trainable, non-dequantizable circuit that is of like, it's just contrived. Usually, usually the question is, can I construct something that does this abstract theoretical task almost always i would say yes but it's like is this ever practically relevant maybe not uh so that's the real goal is like can this be done and so what they look they investigate right in this work i'm going to scroll down uh to this one figure uh, basically how sort of variational can we get to oh, that's weird it doesn't render and if I looked at this in Chrome and it rendered nicely, I don't know why it's not rendering here, but basically if we look at sort of the most variational models, then this is supposed to be, by the way, this is supposed to be orange over here and blue over here on the left. Um, but the orange one on the right, right, is, uh, is dequantizable. And the, the ones on the left are less dequantizable. And so, the question is basically where does the intersection lie between trainability and dequantizability or simulatability is a similar direction. And so uh, there's, there's, a, there's a nice figure right here that shows like if you have something, do you have something else, right? So if you have gradient based trainability, then uh, I mean, obviously you have trainability. I think that's pretty clear. But if you have trainability, that does not imply that you have gradient-based trainability. So that's an important uh, important aspect, right? And so this is just a nice figure that shows all of these things. Um, and so the real question is, uh, right? Like if you have gradient-based trainability, does that automatically mean you can dequantize it? Not necessarily, um, but these are counter examples, right? They say, 
uh, we quote the results that contain counterexamples. Uh, so this is not necessarily, um, you know, known universally, but uh, the question here is basically, uh, what does the line look like between simulatability and um, other aspects of it. You can see here they distinguish clearly between dequantization and simulatability. Uh, we can go to the definitions. It doesn't, it's not super important, but basically all of this is just a follow-up to exploring this core idea that I'm, I'm not going to get into much more. It's just because it's very theoretical, but it has practical relevance of what can we do that's trainable and not classically simulatable or dequantizable. And that, to me, as far as I know in the literature, is basically an open question and is honestly the question that should have predated most of the work in this field, right? Like there's like thousands of papers. The last uh, the two papers ago, we just said, like they found like 3,500 papers. Let me just find this. 3,500 papers that showed that used like quantum and MNIST or something in it. Where is it? Uh, nope, 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 nope. Here we go. Yeah, 3,500 papers that do some sort of classification, learning, or supervised in quantum physics. And so, I mean, that's huge, right? There's a lot of work and it's like, this is the question that matters, right? It's like, because if we, suppose we can efficiently simulate every work or every practically relevant work of quantum machine learning, then it's like, are any of these works interesting or relevant? Like where, where does this field exist if that's true? And so that's to me the most important question. And one that, I don't know, this has been, I mean, it's been underlying the field the entire time. It's like, what can we do with quantum machine learning? It's always, always the question beyond just being like, oh, cool, we can take gradients on quantum computers, but what can we do with it that's practically relevant? I mean, that's always been a question. And so this is just really theoretically these works are just really theoretically outlining it. And so hopefully that's something that if you're working on your next QML paper, then you can take it away and think about it more. Um, I will probably not to think about it too much more because I, I remain uh, skeptical and in the size of this little question mark zone, does it exist at all? And if so, is it, bigger than a tiny, tiny little cube. Um, and there's really uh, only one way to find out, but uh, you know, we'll see how the field progresses. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, this, this video. I just had these tabs open for so long being like, I'm gonna talk about these someday. Um, and that day is today. Uh, there's not too much more quantum content coming that I have planned at least. There's some stuff on QDHMC Quantum Dynamical Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. That was a paper that I wrote with some other people actually like two years ago now. It's just getting published recently, but uh, that was just sitting in the backlog for a while. So I put out, I mean, we put out the code and everything. So I'll probably make a video explaining that it's sort of adjacent to QML. I don't think I'd call it a QML algorithm. Um, it's really more of a sampling algorithm on quantum computers. Uh, but that's that's probably the, the next quantum video. I don't know if there's any more quantum videos after that, to be honest. We'll see. We will see. But yeah, I don't have anything planned. And so I think it's what what videos do I have planned after that? There's a few actually, there's a few. Um, there's a selection of classical machine learning videos I have planned. Some of the code I have already written, it's just a matter of making the videos, but those will probably not happen for a little while. Then there's some actually philosophy videos that I might make sooner. Um, that's probably the next thing after the QDHMC videos will be philosophy videos. It's a series, well, I won't spoil it, um, but hopefully, you know, I, I guess people, uh, people watch the, the channel for the quantum content. So maybe I'll keep a, keep a once a year drip of that or something, but it's, uh, 
as it drops in my own personal research interest, I just don't make as many videos about it because these videos were originally just things I was learning about and interested in. And that's still true. I'm still learning things and I'm still interested in things, but it has certainly shifted um, to, uh, to a field not as directly QML adjacent. So yeah, that's everything, I guess. Um, yeah, let me know, uh, I guess, what your thoughts are on the matter. Do you, uh, do you have faith in QML? Is QML back? Is it over? Uh, maybe, maybe not.